Hello guys, I'm Vishnu. So today we end the drug induced liver disorder series. It has been two videos before and today is the last video. We actually divided it into three segments because this presentation is going to be long and we had expected that. So this is the last part. In the previous two videos, we discussed about the different types of liver failure. Why do we see characteristic symptoms that we see in individual liver disorders, for example, cerebral edema, we see abdominal pain, we see ascites, we see kidney involvement as well. So all these things we discussed. Then we talked in the last video about uh, different types of drug-induced liver disorders. We talked about cirrhosis, we talked about fibrosis, necrosis, hepatic venooclusive diseases. So today we are going to talk about the diagnosis and treatment of drug-induced liver disorder. This is going to be a very short talk because as I said in the past video that drug-induced liver disorders have mostly supportive treatment. Either you have to withdraw the offending drug and then you have to give supportive treatment so that the liver enzymes reduce and the patient comes back to the normal stage as much as possible depending on the severity of the liver damage. So if we talk about diagnosis, we can do biochemical tests. Biochemical tests include liver function tests. We can look into various liver function tests. We can look into bilirubin levels. We can look into SGPT, SGOT, gamma glutarate transferase, etc., etc. Then we can go into serological markers. For example, hepatitis virus markers, Epstein-Barr virus markers. So that can also indicate whether the patient is having a viral infection and a drug-induced hepatotoxicity exacerbated the liver damage. Like I, when I talked about hepatic tumors, I said that there is a term called hepatocellular carcinoma. And hepatocellular carcinoma directly does not happen to a patient due to a medication. It only happens when you are using a hepatotoxic medicine in a patient who is already infected with hepatitis B, hepatitis C virus. So... Here also we can understand to some extent the extent of liver damage or what is the role of viral virus in this particular condition. Then we can go into radiological investigations. Uh, ultrasonography or CT scan can also reveal the extent of liver damage and liver biopsy. So this can be very good because uh, this is much more specific. It will give you a uh, understanding as to the extent of diagno uh, diagnosis of hepatitis, cirrhosis, and even hepatocellular carcinoma. If we come to the treatment of drug-induced liver disorders, we usually use antidotes for iron and paracetamol-associated liver damage. If it is iron-induced liver damage, then we give antidotes. We have desferioxamine, deferiprone, etc. Anyways, uh, when I start with the uh, toxicology series, I will talk about iron poisoning and paracetamol poisoning. Then I will explain about this in detail. And in paracetamol-associated liver damage, we usually use N-acetylcysteine. So that is a very good antidote. Methionine, to some extent, is also a good antidote for paracetamol-associated hepatotoxicity. We can use uh, corticosteroids as well, especially if there is autoimmune liver damage involved. Autoimmunity means automatic immunity. It means your body's immune system considers your liver as enemy and starts sending inflammatory mediators towards it, which further damage the liver. So corticosteroids can be used if it is autoimmune in nature, if the liver damage is autoimmune in nature. <laughs> Supportive treatment also we can give, for example, hepatoprotectives, that is ursodeoxycholic acid, silimarin and all. So these are very commonly used medicines in the uh, healthcare setup. Definitely nutritional replacement as well. The patient should be asked to stay away from protein diet or protein rich diet as much as possible. I have explained the reason before. So fluid replacement is also very good, especially if the patient is having very severe diarrhea. So fluid replacement, if the patient is having even normal diarrhea also, there can be a risk of dehydration which can further worsen the prognosis. So fluid replacement is also necessary. 
And as I said, if the patient is having pruritus, so pruritus, uh, as I said before, it is like rashes and reddish discoloration that usually is associated with cholestasis because of the release of large amount of bile salts into the bloodstream. So if you're having pruritus, you can use light clothing, avoid woolen or clothes with heavy, uh, with, uh, heavy textures because that can further aggravate the inflammatory process and make you feel more discomfortable. And we can also cool the skin by using calamine lotion or tepid baths. Tepid baths also, it's also known as tepid sponging. So it is just like cold water. We just use a sponge to absorb it and just uh, caress it over the affected areas. If you are having coagulation disorders, I already explained in the first video, you can go into that and check. There I have explained why clotting problems or coagulopathy happens with liver disease. So if you are having bleeding problems, if it is vitamin K deficiency induced, then we can give phytomenadione injection or menadiol sodium phosphate, which can be given orally. But if it is a refractory bleeding, refractory bleeding means it's not responding to phytomenadione or menadiol, means there is very severe bleeding, then we, ha we have to go for fresh frozen plasma or clotting factor concentrates. Definitely in severe cases, if nothing is working, the liver enzymes are drastically high, plasma ammonia level is also very high, the patient is going into very poor pr prognosis, then definitely the healthcare team will have to discuss with the liver transplantation team and make a decision or a consensus on whether the patient is a suitable candidate for liver transplantation. So in, in very severe cases, to save the life of the patient, liver transplantation may be necessary. And definitely we can also advise to some extent a low fat diet that reduces anorexia, nausea and diarrhea in patients with cholestasis. So in cholestatic patients, low fat diet can be useful. So that's it. We have finally finished the drug induced liver disorder series. So there were three videos under that. So it will be available in our playlist. Anytime you wish, you can view, you can understand. Anyways, it is a PharmD fourth year uh, pharmacotherapeutics three topic as well. So for a conceptual understanding, you can refer these videos. If you find this productive and worthwhile, please don't forget to share and subscribe. Share it to maximum people because we are working extremely hard to make sure that the right knowledge and at the maximum pro practical aspect reaches you and obviously reaches a lot of people. So please do support us in our cause. If you have any suggestions, if you wish to give some comments into this or anything, you are please free to welcome. You are always welcome to comment in the comment section or you can contact us in the Telegram and Instagram links that we have provided in the description below. So that's it. Tomorrow I will be coming with a new series and uh, that will be announced to you tomorrow and till then it is bye